But uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have been doing uh, in the last years in our lab. And uh, I'll start just with a brief introduction on the topics that we are studying. And basically what we are interested in the degradation pathways. Uh, the two main degradation pathways in the, in the cell for protein as well as organelles are the ubiquitin. Uh, the, the ubiquitin okay, sorry. Is the ubiquitin pathway and the autophagic pathway. Both of them are a cascade of enzymatic uh, um, function where the concerted action of different enzymes will uh, um, result in the tagging of protein or organelles for degradation or for other purposes. Uh, oh gosh. Okay. Okay. Now. So ubiquitin is very is a very complex system, and most of we many people have heard of is the uh, degrade protosomal degradation. But depending how the ubiquitin changes of form, it has very different functional outcomes for the protein that is tagged to. Uh, the same somehow applies to autophagy, where. Uh, Talking about the autophagy as a, as a single uh, thing is not anymore um, what is believed to be the, the, the truth that happened in the cells, and we have many different types of autophagy playing different roles inside the cell. And given all the complexity and given all the, the functions that it plays or what, what is involved, I think it's fair to say that between the two of them are, are regulating almost all cellular process inside the, the cell. So, uh, so it's not surprising that many genes that are uh, 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 from the ubiquitin pathway have been, the mutation or the regulation has been associated with the onset or the progression of different um, uh, diseases, and in particular for cancer, which we are interested in. in many of the big names in the uh, tumor suppressor or oncogenes are, belongs to the family of the ubiquitin pathway. Uh, they has uh, attracted, of course, the, 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 the attention of several pharmaceuticals, and the first uh, compound was the, developed one of the founding fathers of, of the field, uh, was uh, an inhibitor of the proteasome, which actually is a very interesting story. He, a story he, he tried to convince that was useful for, for curing some uh, diseases, but he wanted to, the pharma to develop a tool that they can use it for the, for the uh, basic science. And, and, uh, and since then, this happened a long time ago, uh, and also led to the, to the it was important for, uh, that this compound was approved in 2003, and the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2004. So I guess that's not a coincidence. Um, and since then, many other companies have tried to, to, to modulate, to find the uh, uh, pharmacological modulators of this pathway, and, uh, and still there, there are not that many uh, working, but there are many on trials and, and starting to, to arrive to clinical trials. The same holds true for autophagy, where many genes are involved. Again, their the regulation is involved in, in, different, um, in different diseases and in particular also, again, in cancer. And again, there are active uh, search for pharmacological modulators of the autophagic pathway for a clinical benefit. Uh, so basically what we are doing in our lab is, as I told you, uh, in anomalous cells, autophagy and ubiquitination are playing an important role in maintaining cellular homeostasis, and when they are uh, uh, they regulated the, the, among other things, and the, 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 the aspect we were interested in is in the tumorigenic transformation of, of the cells. And so what we are trying to understand is, or try to contribute uh, and finding uh, how on which are the components and in which way they are contributing uh, to, to these processes. So we, we focus our attention on a specific type of cancer, which is uh, uh, called triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer is defined by the absence of something. So it's, it, it, it doesn't have the, um, the, any of the um, hormonal receptors that are characteristic to other type of cancer. And so it makes a, a very interesting system to study. And we, 
uh, when we decided to focus in this in this in this uh, cancer, we did it uh, basically following uh, a criteria uh, that uh, we decided that would make sense uh, for for because of clinical relevance as it lacks of effective target treatments. Uh, it has a very bad prognosis. Uh, when, when, when you treat the, the, the cancer, it tends to respond, but then it metastasizes and is a, is a very aggressive cancer. And although it's a small percentage of all the breast cancer, it's about 15%, being breast cancer, uh, a large number of, 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 of the total number of, of, of cancer, a small number of a big number is still a big number. So it has some implication and clinical relevance. Uh, is, a, is affecting specific type of uh, of of, gene uh, of origin. Although it's not clear whether, unfortunately, it has to do with uh, with genetic or socioeconomic groups, and still is a matter of debate. But it has a, 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 an interesting uh, uh, edge uh, on, on where to work. work. And. Uh, on top of that, the other important aspect for us, it has a very interesting experimental advantages, as we have many, like almost 20 cell lines derived for triple negative breast cancer that has been extensively characterized. Uh, those are excellent tools to work in vitro, and if, if you will, I mean, working in, in, in a petri dish is always very far from what is happening in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an in vivo setting, but this type of tumors being uh, insensitive to hormones, uh, one can say that maybe working in Petri dish is a little bit closer compared to if you work with a, or, or it's easier to work and maybe closer to what's happening compared to a system where, where you will require much more information coming from the, from the endocrine system. And the other advantage is that there is some cell lines that you use in vitro you can use it for in vivo experiment of xenograft transplant, so you don't have to translate your results in other cell lines, you can use the very same cell line. And of course there are uh, connections where the, it, both the, 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 the modification of the proteasome or the autophagic pathways are important or are affecting the proliferation or the survival of this uh, type of, of cell lines. So, the other interesting thing is that this tumor is just not, as I said, is defined by the absence of something. So it's a very heterogeneous group where you have different subtype of, 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 of tumors itself inside, and so finding uh, something specific for each type of, of uh, subclasses can be also a very cl important clinical role. So this is a typical uh, and all uh, uh, slide from the whole mark of cancer of Bob Weinberg. And on top of this, we, in the lab, we have uh, three projects going on. One, it has to do with, uh, we found that tricyclic antidepressants that are affecting the autophagic pathway, and uh, we are studying how that can be used for uh, sensi sensitized uh, uh, tumor cells to, to chemotherapeutic agent. Uh, we also have another uh, working on another uh, project working on the, we found that one e ligase is regulating a very important epigenetic uh, modulator uh, um, uh, uh, complex, uh, and we are trying to understand how this is related uh, to, to cancer as well. But the one I'm going to be talking today is we decided to look for uh, uh, genes on the ubiquitin pathway that had or could be involved in process. Uh, related to invasion and metastasis. So, metastasis is the main cause of death of solid tumors, and the cell motility somehow is related to the metastatic uh, um, capacity of the cells, so studying the motility of tumor cells might be relevant for understanding or finding uh, Achilles heels where to hit uh, tumor cells. And uh, it is known that the ubiquitin pathway somehow, as I told you before, is controlling most of everything and, and motility is not an exception. And so the idea is that maybe looking and finding new regulators in the ubiquitin pathway that control this can lead, maybe in the future, can contribute to uh, be uh, more, uh, attractive molecular target. 
Having said that, I mean we are we are trying to use this system in both ways, not only to to try to translate our research somehow or provide some evidence that maybe in the future someone else can tra translate that, but also maybe uh, it, it can help us to, to unveil some new function of the ubiquitin system and try to, if w one can dig deep on the molecular mechanism, finding new functions for the, for, for the, the ubiquitin system. So all, uh, this story, most of, what, of all of what I show is gonna, is done, has been done by a very talented PhD student. She was coming from the, she did her undergraduate thesis in uh, Drosophila, and had, so she should switch and decided like a more uh, uh, suicidal mission, come to my lab and, and start doing a screen and start working with anything new. So, so it has been a very, uh, very gratifying experience that at the end we got something even if more something out of it. So what we did is a, SH, a pool SHRNA SHR screen and basically in this pool what you do, you take a cell line, you infect it with a, li a library of SHRNA targeting whatever you, you, you want and then with a control SHRNA after you have is, uh, pro produce wherever you, you, you pass it through a selection process, and then you compare the SHRNA that are present in the control compared to the treated one, and then you can have an idea which were the genes that, that you, that which the inhibition are relevant for the phenotype that you are looking at. We did this in collaboration with another Argentinian that is in the, now mm -hmm. is a Denver, uh, and he's the head of uh, functional genomics there uh, at Colorado University. So, what, as I told you, we were interested in, the, in, uh, in motility and in migration, so we tried to, to look for a system in vitro that could resemble somehow or could have some features that we can then uh, try to, 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 to correlate with metastatic uh, capacity, and this is, this is a system that is, has been used for, for several years, that is migration assay. And what you use is a trans -world system where you have an insert which has a, a porous membrane with holes, and you seed the cells on the top of this membrane, and if you give enough time, the cells will migrate through the pores, and of course they will not drop, but they will attach on the, on the lower surface. So you, you, you seed the cells, after a while you have cells on the, on the upper part of the membrane, on the lower part of the membrane, and depending which one you remove, you can uh, um, recover the other one, and then you can amplify those, and if you want, you can study or doing some uh, amplification or enrichment cycle. So in our in our screen, what we did is we took uh, uh, MDA and B two three one cell lines that are derived from triple negative breast cancer and have been used, extensively used as a, as a model system for many many labs, and we infected with a library of sHRNA. Uh, uh, directed for ubiquitin pathway uh, genes, and then we seed it on the upper compartment, we let them uh, migrate, and then we recover the cells that didn't migrate, and what we did is apply several rounds of amplification trying to, to enrich in the population the, the, the SHRNAs, which we are targeting, in this case we were interested in positive regulator of migration, so uh, genes that when you knock down the cells stop migrating. Uh, and so what we expected is during the selection process this, the SHRNA that blocks migration would be enriched, the ones that uh, promote that induce more migration will, uh, will be lost and, uh, and the neutral uh, they also will be lost or will be reduced compared to after 10 cycles, you keep finding cells that migrate. A little bit, yes, yes. Uh, it's actually, yes, so you, you still have, because there is a stochastic uh, event, and you, 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 you could, uh, you could, uh, um, not, not, even to start with, not all the cells don't migrate or migrate. There are some other components or things, and it will depend on how long. So. I will tell you, we, we, we set up, Fabiana set up the conditions for, uh, in a given amount of time, for uh, all the conditions to have a, a very robust assay. I guess that if you leave it longer, you will get a certain point that they don't, don't migrate anymore. 
So what we did is, before studying, and because he was a, a PhD student, we decided to do a feasibility study somehow in silico to see whether this was possible or not. So what we did is, in this system, we have a, we simulated like what we have is like we have a population that has some among all all the population there are some SHRNAs that will prevent the cell to migrate and with the cycles you enrich and you have only those that prevent the migration okay so this can be modeled by a, by a, by this uh, formula and what we did is. And you can change several parameters here. So what we did is say, okay, let's say we have only one SHRNA. How long will it take? Uh, how many cycles do we have to do with the starting from a, a self that uh, migrate at this point to get to something we were looking at 80% uh, that lost the 80% of the migration? And we saw that it will take around 10, 11 cycles, even if there is only one SHRNA. And given the fact that one cycle took to Fabiana a couple of weeks, it was compatible with a PhD student and, and my career as well. So we decided to go on. And as I told you, she did a terrific job in trying to set up conditions that were very robust and, and in trying to uh, quantify the cells that are in the upper compartment, in the lower compartment, trying to avoid problems that you might have just because the cells don't attach well. So you, basically, she, she could uh, count. This is, this is a transport which is uh, opaque, so it, it is the, 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 the fluorescent doesn't go through, so you can count the cells on one side and on the other one in the same transport. So if you play 50,000 cells, you have to get, and she can count, this is a transwell by tiling all of the cells, so by staining by DAPI, so she, she should have 50,000 cells summing this and this. And uh, it took a little bit of uh, time, but she did it, and we have a very robust system to work with. So we did the selection. Oh, we, when I say we, uh, Fabiana did the selection, of course. And uh, as you can see, we, we, we we were starting this, and we have to decide when to stop it, and we decide to stop it when the cells reach around, uh, or we're getting close to 20%, and we saw kind of a plateau, so we decided to stop it here. And what we saw is that if we take uh, the, the cell line that was infected with a controller search RNA, although it lost some of the uh, um, invasion ca capability, uh, a migration capability, it was not dramatic compared to the ones that were harboring the uh, SHRNA directed to, to, the, to the genes of the UPS. Uh, and it was very encouraging saying that maybe you have selected something that was uh, indeed blocking the migration. So then go, going back to our formula, and then we will see that it's not as accurate, but I guess it's in the order of magnitude more or less uh, Accurate. He was telling us that more or less we should expect to have at least uh, between 50, I could say between 10 and 100 uh, SHRNA responsible for that phenotype, which is also manageable in terms of, of a, a, a analysis. So then we did the sequencing, and what you can see is by uh, uh, in each cycle. Uh, this is the, ex the relative expression of each, each SHRNA, each point is an SHRNA. Most of them were lost, and only a few of them were enriched uh, by the, uh, as a time dependence. And you can see also that we were losing most of the SHRNA, which we would expect. Interesting enough, this is the, the amount of SHRNA present in the library, and these, uh, we lost about 10% just by infecting the cell lines and keeping in, in culture before doing any selection. And this is interesting because what you expect is that those that you are getting rid of are those SHRNA that are targeting essential genes. So those that are targeting essential genes, you will get rid in this part, and most of them were targeting proteasomal uh, subunit, which is, was consistent because cells cannot survive without proteasomal subunit. So, but then the, the things start to look a little bit odd. Oh, this is the same as before, and where each layer is a cycle of selection, 
And what we can see is, and, and the, each bar is an SHRNA, the frequency, the, the frequency you can see before selection, there are a lot of them as, 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 uh, as far as you are going through the selection process, there is one that is taking over most of the variability. So if that would have been uh, not an off-target effect, we wouldn't be very happy. But as usual, uh, that was not the case. And what we saw is that after 11 cycles, there were three of them that were accounted for 90% of all the SHRNA that were present. But uh, there are several um, problems that you have to deal with when you're doing this type of, of screen, and one is off-target effect coming from two sources. One is that SHRNA can have off-target effect because the sequence can bind to anything. And on top of that, what you might have is a positional uh, problem. The, 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 the cassette that is expressed in the SHRNA can be inserted in a gene that is important for the phenotype that you're interested in, so you're going to be selected not because of the sequence, but because of, a, of, a, of an insertional thing. So, so one criteria in order to, to be more uh, uh, confident with your result is that you, each of the genes that are targeted by this library are targeted by five different SHRNAs. So one criteria is at least you have to find two SHRNA, different SHRNA that are targeting the genes, otherwise you discard. At least we find only one SHRNA for this one, so we decide that these were off-target effect. And looking a little bit better, what we saw is that around, uh, around cycle four, we could see that the, some of them were increasing, and then as soon as these three were taking over, they were decreasing. So. Uh, that meant that most likely, if we focus only on the last cycles, we were losing some critical information. And of course, we didn't have this hindsight to know it before. So Fabiana was pissed off because she did seven more cycles than she required. But anyhow, uh, that's, that's how it, I did. Uh, so showing you another way, the, if, if, you, if you check on the, on the non-selected one, and, and you plot the ones that were selected in, in cycle 11, it's just a tiny fraction and there are only few. So instead of, of cycle 4, you have a much nicer variability and more, more SHRNA that you can play with. And of course, you still have this inside this one, so you are not losing information in cycle 4. So we decided to focus on cycle 4. And what we use is, in order to choose our target or to start working with one gene, we use like a multifactorial type of analysis where we first uh, choose the enrichment cycle, we say it was a four, then we, we, we chose all of them which were uh, upregulated more than one SHRNA per each gene, that led us to a candidate's list of 30 genes then what we did is check among the literature to, to check which one of them were already published that had anything to do with migration or tumorigenesis or metastasis. And, and, think, and, and we were surprised that almost half of them were already published. So it was a good thing because it was a proof of principle that somehow our, our screen was selecting for something that, that, that makes sense. And then we still have 17 genes. So we have to decide again to which one's going to be the one to pick and we use like a very brute force <coughs> type of uh, say, but what we decided is Fabiana did uh, 51 cell lines, meaning all these 17 genes were targeted by three different SHRNA, and the only thing we could do with all of those uh, as quick as we could, it was analyze the phenotype of the cells, and we chose one, SH one gene to start with in this, in this list, because it showed um, a most dramatic change in the phenotype. And then I'll show you which, which is the, the change in the phenotype. So this gene is called USP19. USP19, I, 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 I didn't mention before, but the ubiquitin as well as the autophagy pathway uh, as any other post-relational modification doesn't only work in one direction, but there are enzymes that are devoted to getting rid of the signal, like uh, 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 kinases and phosphatases. In the ubiquitin system, you have E3 ligases and the ubiquitinases. And ESP19 is one of these deubiquitinases. It means that it gets in, it's getting rid of the ubiquitin signal from the protein, which is, a, which is the function 
uh, of getting rid of the signal is still a, a matter of debate uh, because some some something that uh, the, the ubiquitinase might work as a quality control in the type of branch of ubiquitin that you make. The, the, the fact is that they are present and they are playing a lot of important roles and more importantly they do have catalytic active, intrinsic catalytic activity and they work as a as a protease, system protease more or less, so, so they are easy to target. So we focus on USP19. Uh, what is known, there are 15 papers, so there, are, there is not much of it, and there is, I could say, there is no consensus of what it's doing and what it's not. What is clear is that it's present in the ER and is and is acting on on trafficking pathways. So then we started our characterization, and this is, as I told you, these are the normal cells which are like mesenchymal, like like, like this, separated. When you knock down USP19, they tend they tend to to grow more like a cobblestone. Mm -hmm. A form uh, and having more uh, uh, distinct uh, um, borders, uh, and one can think that uh, somehow uh, more migration is associated with um, a mesenchymal uh, phenotype, while less migration is associated with more uh, epithelial uh, uh, phenotype. So we decided to focus on USPNT because it was clearly that it had played some role there. Uh, we check, and uh, our research RNA were able to knock down the, the expression as well the protein levels. Another, the first thing that we check is that if it was or was not affecting pro cell proliferation, because of course the, the cell proliferation can be a, um, a bias in th those type of screening because if the cells uh, grow faster, they will uh, somehow compensate for the fact that they can, uh, they, they might or might not change the migration uh, capacity, but if they grow, they grow faster, they cannot grow other, other type of, of, of clones that are present, and uh, doing in two different ways, the cell seems to grow at least in two D seems to work at the same, uh, proliferate at the same, at the same rate. Uh, then we did uh, repeat with the new cell lines reinfected with the, with the same chambers that we used before, and we saw that they was changing the, the, the uh, migration capacity. And then we use another type of assay that is called wound healing, where basically what you do is you, you, you have a confluent uh, cell line uh, plate, you do a scratch, and you see how fast the, the wound is closed. And you can see the control, but these are all the, at the same time, and the control is almost closed, while the other two, it takes longer. And also the, the interesting thing, how they migrate. If you can see here, they are like scattered. They go around, uh, more or less, trying to they organize. And in this, when you knock down USP19, you can see that they they're keeping this uh, very structured cobblestone shape, and and they are uh, migrating in a less efficient way. So then. Uh, if the cells move or somehow migrate less uh, and to connect with something more relevant for an in vivo setup, we decided to look whether the, the cells can uh, invade or, and we did it in two different ways. This, uh, uh, we did it with Matujek and, and what I'm showing here is basically you put a drop of agar, noble agar, and then you see the cells around and then you see whether the cells can get into the drop or not. And you can see that the control cells but a number of cells and displacement are much efficient compared to the knock, knock, knock down uh, cell line. Um, so then, if, again, uh, we were selecting for migration, but we didn't know migration can be affected both. Yes, of course it will be affected if something is affecting the, the, the motility machinery of the cells, but it also can be affected if it's changing the... the, the um, the entity of the cells. As, as I told you before, if the cell is more uh, mesenchymal, it will tend to migrate more, and if it's epithelial, it will tend to migrate less, and more uh, mesenchymal tend to be more aggressive, and maybe they will tend to be more, uh, have more uh, clonogenic or, or tumorogenic capacity. So we check into this whether seeding sparse cells, how many colonies we can get, and that is a, is a, is a measure of the clonogenic capacity of these, of these cell lines, and what we observe is that USP19 
didn't seem to change that, to change that much compared to the control, uh, at least in this in this essay. To our surprise, when we did the same essay, but in in a in a 3D system where instead of plating the cells on a on, on, on a petri dish, you put the cells inside a matrix gel, and you see how much they grow. What we observe is that these cells, the control cells, we are ma we are making colors that were much bigger compared to the knockdown. So the the, the capacity of, of of producing a colony was not affected, but the size somehow it was. And then, again, coming back to the fact that uh, more uh, epithelial, if you want, cell line will be more, uh, uh, more benign compared to mesenchymal, and that sometimes is associated with the fact that the cells uh, become more sensitive to chemotherapeutic agents. And here we use two different chemotherapeutic agents, one that is used for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer, doxorubicin, and portesomy, which is an inhibitor of the protosome. We repeat it, this is not the last one, we have to repeat it many more times, and there is no difference between them. But I guess that one conclusion, although it is what it is, so we are not happy or sad about it, but interesting, the portesomy was telling us something important. If you look at and and ubiquitin as enzymes, you, you may expect to have um, an overload of ubiquitinated protein. And that might have some off-target effect just because you have a lot of ubiquitin proteins uh, inside the cells and maybe you are stopping, stalling the, the, the proteasome. So whatever you are looking at, it might, it might just be a, a fact that because you have too much ubiquitin going, going on. And, uh, and instead, bortezomib was killing the cells in the same way control and knock down. So what, what, somehow, if you want, this was suggesting that the, 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 the possible targets of USP-19 were not just uh, a broad and forced stalling of the, of the ubiquitin protein system, but were acting on specific targets that we yet have to, uh, to identify. So then we, the next obvious step was characterizing in vivo, and what we did is uh, doing two types of experiment, one injecting orthotopic in the fat pad, and then injecting on the tail vein and looking at the metastatic capacity. And what injecting orthotopic, what we saw is that uh, this is the control, and what you check is the tumor volume, have the tumor grow. And we were very surprised because in, in an in vivo setting, uh, the control cells were able to produce uh, 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 tumors in all the animals we, we injected, while the knockdown, they didn't even uh, produce tumors in, 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 in it was, it's, one of them was blocking, uh, it was only producing tumors in 20% and the other one in 50%. And, and the ones that were producing was taking, were having tumors were taking much longer to, to develop. So somehow, uh, we don't know yet what, what does it mean, but maybe this, uh, uh, this problem that this cell shows in trying to, sh to grow in a, in, a, in a more 3D matrix might be related to the fact that this, the, the, the lack of USP-18 might be important for preventing the growth of the tumor. Uh, of course, here, this... This, we took some of the in the in the animals that uh, that that were uh, that developed tumors. We took some of the cell the, the tumors and uh, produced um, isolated the cells back and check whether we wanted to check two things. First, we checked that the USP19 was still knocked down in those in those tumors. So so know that the ones that suddenly started to grow is because uh, they were selected ones where the, the knockdown was, was, was lost. So they were still knocked down, and although there are some differences, it seems that at least in vitro, again, when we put it back in the, in the tissue culture, it doesn't seem to have uh, much of a difference in the proliferation. So it seems that to be something specific, although we have to, to carefully repeat this a, a couple more times, something related to some uh, constraint that these cells have when they are in a more um, 3D, environment compared to the and then what we did is instead 
w one way to look at metastasis would be to, to allow the tumor to grow and then uh, take out the, the, the target uh, uh, organs for metastasis, which are normally lungs and, and brain in this case. But the fact is that to do in, like, uh, spontaneous metastasis in this case was very difficult because uh, the control, uh, you, you should take the animals when they have the same tumor size and th there was a delay, there was something that we couldn't compare clearly how, how the, the experiment was going to work. So we decided to go more uh, control system, which is injecting directly uh, through the tail vein the, the cells and, and checking how many cells, uh, how much uh, the, the cells can be found after two months in the labs. And this is what you do is you stain this with the uh, Indian ink and the white dots are the metastatic foci. And what we observe is when you knock down a uh, USP-19, you have much lower amount of metastatic uh, foci. Again, we don't know whether this is because they get less or when even if they get um, they cannot grow as the same as they didn't grow in the in the orthotopic experiment. So just we, we prove it in another type of cell line also driving from triple negative and we observed that knockdown of USP19 was reducing the, the, the migration. Uh, we also observe uh, both are reduced uh, in, the, in, the, in the growth of the tumor and the amount of the animals were, that were developing tumors. So we have another cell line from the same uh, uh, tumors, type of tumors that we are, that we are uh, having the, the same phenotype. So uh, I think it, this is one of the last part. What we did is decided to, to to take a, instead of a, this is the, the cell lines I showed you before, which are highly invasive and multi, and this one we knocked down USP-19. So what we decided to take is a cell line that have low migration capacity, and instead of knocking down USP-19 in those conditions, we overexpress USP-19. And, and, and what, when we overexpress USP-19, we used two concerts, one that was wild type and one that was uh, catalytic death. And here some Spanish <laughs> managed to oh. escape. Anyhow, so, so the parental cell line are mat they grow, as I told you, more epithelial in cobblestone. When we overexpress USP19, we have a more diffuse and more uh, spindle like cell type, and when we express the mutant, we still have a, 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 a phenotype that resembles. So, so in a way, we are telling that in, in, in a, not, not only the, 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 the reduction of USP-18 in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very highly migratory cell can have an effect, but also if you take a low migratory cell and you have express, it seems that the, not only the expression, but it seems that specifically the, acti the the enzymatic activity was required for this phenomenon. And what we did is, uh, what we did is here again, uh, good healing assay, and if you take the, the, the expressing the wild type compared to the mutant, the wild type can close the, the wound much faster than the, than the mutant. And, uh, I, we don't have it here, but the controls were somehow in the middle compared to the to the mutant and to the one that were expressing the wild type. So maybe the the mutant has some um, uh, uh, dominant negative, negative effect uh, on, on endogenous one. And again, the, the other striking effect is in this case the opposite happens when you uh, these cell lines they don't tend to grow because basically. Uh, they, they, they are not making much of a tumor. It's a little bit more complicated. I, I, I'm just simplifying it. They require they are they require some hormones to make the tumors. We didn't put the tumor the hormones inside the animals externally. So normally the the control cells uh, don't don't make any tumors. So here when we overexpress the wild type, we have very nice tumors, and when we overexpress the mutant. Uh, they behave as the control cells, they don't develop tumors. So again, more USP-18 in these conditions leads to more migration and leads to more uh, production of tumors. 
So as for the molecular mechanism, we are still trying to understand or trying to, to find a way to, to tackle that. We have the, uh, several hypotheses, but one of them, and which we, didn't, we are starting to analyze, is maybe USP19 has something to do with this process that called epithelial mesenchymal transition or mesenchymal epithelial transition that basically is changing from epithelial state to mesenchymal state and making, and it is known that uh, it's reversible, it can go both ways, so you have, you have, you, there are some genes that you affected them, it, it can go from one phenotype to another one, and the cell line we were using is a very nice uh, model for this, um, and there are different uh, pathways that are affecting this, uh, uh, this system, so we are trying to, to connect USP19 to those pathways somehow and try to, to discover whether there is a connection. And interesting enough, also in cancer, these processes are important uh, because they are required first as to become more mesenchymal to get out from the from an, an invade, and then when they get into the distant metastasis, they, they have they have they, they should be able to to go back and make and make more epithelial cells to grow. So so this is a reversible system that if you block it in, in any direction, it uh, doesn't matter which one can have a very important uh, um, beneficial effect. So conclusion, we have identified our new putative regulator of cell tumor migration, uh, and we show it that in vivo as well, and it seems to have an important uh, function uh, related to the catalytic activity, which leads us to the fact that we we can uh, uh, in the future are, are also trying to, to to collaborate with one company trying to figure it out whether there are some already compounds specific for USP19 to block it and see if they have any effect on the on the tumor growth and. Uh, and we will do try to uh, to to dig that deep in the molecular mechanism, and we are working with uh, some uh, with the chief of the oncology department of one of the hospital in, in Buenos Aires to try to see whether the, there is a differential expression of USP19 in different tumor samples from from patients, and see how much we can uh, relate to that. And with this, I would like to thank Fabiana. She did all the work, so really it, it was a very ta uh, uh, difficult task and very challenging one. Uh, the collaborators and the people giving the money, of course, you for staying awake at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>